Welcome. Wednesday night Bible study. Pastor Kim Wilcox. Hey, we are doing a live remote uh, this evening. Uh, we are in Wyoming on spring break. We have somebody at the house taking care of our dogs, which is great. Uh, we thank them for that. But uh, uh, other than that, we are joining you from snowy Grand Teton country this evening. Uh, if you're watching this evening, I encourage you to share this uh, on your page this evening so it helps get that out to others can see what uh, we're doing, what we're about. We're going to be in uh, Volume 2. We're going to be in Session 9 this evening. So hopefully you have your Bible, you have your um, coffee, your water, whatever you need. Uh, hopefully you've got the uh, uh, Bible study ready to go this evening for you. So I'm going to share this on our page. All right, there we go. So greetings. Hopefully this week has been well for you. Uh, we're excited to be able to uh, uh, join with you this evening on Bible study. We're just going to continue on in our sessions. Uh, this evening is the, the person and the work of, of Christ. And so that's exciting to think about what uh, the Lord's doing for and in us and with us and in all that we're doing. Um, as we begin this evening, we do have a couple of announcements for you. Uh, we have uh, uh, the food pantry tomorrow at Pomona from 1 to 4. Uh, so uh, for those of you that are working, uh, I think they're going to be there uh, 12-ish to get ready and get set up and then go. Uh, so if you can't be there, we encourage you to be in prayer for that. Uh, that people would not only see uh, the physical food aspect of it, but uh, the spiritual side as well. They would see Jesus in the midst of it. Um, also, Sunday morning from 1030, uh, we'll be live on Facebook. Uh, Pastor Jim Scadell is going to bring the message. We'll be live at North Baptist Church, so you're welcome to come and join in the festivities there, uh, the fellowship, the worship, or you can join us live. So either way that works for you, that's exciting uh, to have you be a part of that. Uh, again, this evening, it, uh, it it's great to be able to do this. You know, it's really amazing how God has just opened up the technology for us today that uh, enables us to do even what we're doing this evening. Uh, we've got uh, fairly decent internet here. We've got, uh, uh, we're miles away from where most of our family and friends are at North Baptist in Ottawa. Uh, but I know others watch from uh, faraway places as well. So uh, it's a great opportunity uh, that we have. And so we really thank the Lord for that this evening. Uh, I do want to remember those that have been uh, mentioned on the prayer list there at, uh, at North uh, through the uh, prayer team, through Sunday morning, <clears throat> continue to pray for Cora and her recovery, uh, continue to pray for uh, Scott and Tanya and their recovery, and then there's an unspoken uh, for them as well. Uh, continue to pray for uh, Jake Skidell. He'll be transferring to a new unit here pretty quick if he hasn't already, and uh, I want to pray for God to just continue to use him in a mighty way uh, for that as well. Uh, also, uh, see, uh, uh, Joe Brandel uh, is going to have some uh, spots removed off his face here pretty quick, so we want to remember him uh, as he as he goes through that. Uh, several others, um, Joel Tigreen, who uh, experienced cancer and uh, is still battling with that. Uh, we just ask the Lord's healing upon him. Uh, baby Asher continues to grow. They're hoping he can gain some weight before he has uh, surgery towards the end of the uh, month. Uh, also saw uh, with uh, Linda Sears and uh, her knee. Uh, we've been praying for that for a considerable, <clears throat> considerable amount of time. And with that, uh, she was able to uh, get start to be scheduled to have an MRI and a, an x-ray and stuff. So I really pray that God moved forward uh, with that for her as well. Uh, I pray for Baby Owen for his hearing. Uh, many others upon that list. And uh, we know each one of those that... Uh, God can really work in their lives as well. And so with that this evening, if you join me in prayer as we begin. Uh, Lord, we truly thank you this evening for uh, your presence. Uh, you know, we've experienced uh, the glorious side of your creation uh, this week as we have been uh, able to be out and about and see some of the sights that you've created and, and your majesty. And, and Lord, it is amazing. Uh, Things uh, did not happen in a Big Bang. Things happened when you said and you spoke and you created. And you said, Lord, let it be. And it was good. 
And Lord, we've seen this week that it really is good. Uh, you are an amazing God. And Lord, I know there's still uh, lots of things going on in the world today. Uh, lots of things going on right here in our own country uh, with the uh, uh, coronavirus, with uh, different things going on within our government. And Lord, that's something that uh, none of this has caught you by surprise. And, and so we ask for not only your divine intervention, your hand of uh, movement within that, but Lord, that you would uh, bring these things to our minds and that we would see what you're doing. And Lord, we do pray for the food pantry tomorrow, uh, for all those workers that will be there. We pray for those that will come through the line and, and be served. But uh, Lord, we know as well as you do that uh, we pray that it's uh, a far-reaching out uh, reach uh, much more than just the food, but uh, they'll see the spiritual side of it as well. And Lord, they'll be able to see Jesus, and boy, we really need that in the midst of this uh, time that we live today. So Lord, as we open up your study this evening, and we talk about the, the person and the work of Christ, Lord, we just ask that you would let us see that. Speak to us this evening. Uh, Lord, help us to glean from this message. And so we give you praise for that. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, this evening as we open this up, it's a, it's a great opportunity, again, as I mentioned, to be able to um, share with you this evening from from far away and uh, and just being a part of this Bible study together. Uh, you know, it really opens up new avenues and new doors for who we are and what we can do. Uh, uh, next week's study will be session 10. We'll be talking about the kingdom of God. Uh, shortly, we'll begin a, a new book, uh, the the volume three. So if you would like one of those books, be sure to start sending us, or either Shelly and I, a message or something uh, so we can get those out and available to you. Uh, again, as I said, this is session nine, 10, 11, 12. Then a couple weeks, we'll be in a, in a new book. Uh, here's what I want to encourage you. If you've fallen behind, um, just set that aside for a while. You can always go back to it right where you are. Uh, pick up with that. Uh, you know, finish up where we are here in this uh, green volume two and then pick up with volume three and just uh, move forward with that. Uh, that's what I would really encourage you to do. So, um, you know, don't get discouraged. Don't quit because oh, I'm too far behind. I can't keep up. That's perfectly fine. Just get in what you can do. Get as much done as you can and just glean what God is doing in the midst of that. That's what I want to encourage you with. And so this evening, the, the session nine is the, the person and the work of Christ. And so the key truth about this evening's Bible study is that Jesus is God who reconciles us back to God. So Jesus is God who reconciles us back to God. And so we've seen throughout this uh, discipleship path uh, that, that Jesus is much more than just a, a key figure in, in history. We've taken a deeper look uh, last week at the doctrine of God, and we, or two weeks ago, and then the doctrine of humanity. And this evening we're going to look about the key doctrines of, of who Jesus is, the work of Christ, this, this God-man, Jesus. To begin with, we're going to focus on the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, uh, things that are recorded in the Gospel of Luke. So if you have your Bible, you might uh, go ahead and open to the Gospel of Luke this evening. <coughs> Excuse me, we'll see that. Jesus himself even emphasized that about his identity, about his work in the in the world today. And so as we saw in the previous session that uh, human beings were and are created by God in God's image, designed to live in a relationship with him. And that's one of the key factors of all this Bible study that we've got to come to understand is that, G that God created us uh, in his image so that when Jesus came, he was the God-man who would offer salvation to mankind because of sin. And so God's original plan then was corrupted by the presence of sin. You find that in Genesis chapter 3. And our connection with God was, was severed and our relationship was broken. And there's nothing that we can really do on our own that would bring us back into that relationship with him. But thankfully, as we see this evening, that it, that it points to Jesus. And so as we prepare this evening to look at both the person and the work of Christ, I really encourage you to take a moment and just uh, 
reflect on on your experiences with with who Jesus is and, and what you know about Him in your life. Um, acknowledge really, uh, truly that there is sin in our lives. Uh, sin is a reality. Uh, we take a moment to silently confess that we are sinners. We continue to sin, and that but that we ask for forgiveness of those things, whether it be just harsh words, whether it be thoughts, whether it be great concerns, or whatever it is. And we do that before we engage in scriptures. And so you can do that on a daily basis um, as you read through your Bible to really ask for God's presence in the midst of that. Ask for greater awareness this evening of God's uh, spirit. Uh, as we look into God's word this, this evening, that he would really uh, open up a truth uh, that maybe we've not seen or been uh, uh, revealed to us before. And then praise Jesus for the good news of the gospel. Uh, that he's changed your life, and that he can change the lives of those that, that you come in contact with. And so he wants to use our obedience to him to be able to follow him. And so that's where we're going to kind of begin this evening. And so a lot of different people have been influential just on a, on a major scale throughout human history. And as we look back across the centuries, uh, we're indebted to men and women who literally changed the course, not only of civilization, but of the entire world. Uh, for example, we, we think about Alexander the Great, who tutored Aristotle, the famous philosopher. Alexander had a convincing claim that the most successful military tactician in the history of the world, and by the time he died in his early 30s, Alexander was undefeated in battle, and had conquered a huge territory, stretching from Egypt to Greece all the way to the borders of India. After his death, Alexander's work was vital in spreading Greek culture throughout much of the world. And his conquest laid the foundation for the later rise of the Roman Empire. Johannes Gutenberg was another one of who hugely influential. Uh, one of those figures in history, although his contributions were much different than those of Alexander the Great. Gutenberg invented the movable type printing press in the middle of the 15th century, which ushered in a new era of mass communication. It's almost like what we think of today, that mass communication. It increased literacy, it facilitated the spread of the radical ideas such as Protestant theology and nation-based languages. And then moving closer to our time even, we have Marie Curie. Uh, serves as one of the world's most influential scientists. Uh, Marie was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, or the prize for on two separate occasions and in two separate fields, one for chemistry and one for physics. Her discovery in radioactivity uh, paved the way for the modern practices of like x-ray machines and radiation therapy. And so as we think in our own lives, what are some people in history that really stuck out to us, that really made us think, that really helps us to understand uh, something greater? And so we encourage you to, to jot that down. And maybe it's even, even Jesus himself, uh, or it could be some other human throughout uh, the time of history. And so thinking about important people in the past reminds us of the truth that Jesus Christ is without a doubt the most influential person in all of history, in all of the world. And as we'll see in the following uh, lesson this evening, as we go through it, Jesus' impact on the world can be traced to both who he is and what he's done. And even our calendars today are designed and centered around Jesus and his, his birth. And so thinking about influential people in history, you know, who might you add to this list of those that I mentioned this evening? There are, there are plenty. Uh, the list is, could go on and on and on, I'm sure. But then how has Jesus' influence unique from other people in history? 
A lot of people did things, but remember, as we spoke, they were created in the image of God. Jesus is God. And so in the midst of that, you know, where do we see the evidence then of Jesus' life throughout history? Even the most staunch atheist can acknowledge that, that Jesus probably is one of the most influential people in the history of the world. Now, Christians have a much greater sense and a concept of that than an atheist would because of what he's done individually for each one of them, that he, he died for our sins. But even an atheist has to agree that Jesus was and Jesus is, and he done some uh, major things while he was here. But when people encounter the living Jesus over and over again through the gospel, it changes lives. And so that's what we want to write down is, you know, what is the influence of Jesus' life on the gospel and how does it affect our world today? Now today's session really digs into the deeper meaning of the influence of Jesus, both examining what he did and, and what he said. We're going to look at the identity of Jesus. And the irony of the fact is though Jesus is the most influential person in history, for some there's still disagreement about his true identity. There's a unique controversy about Jesus that isn't true of any other historical person throughout history. And so what are some opinions people have about Jesus today? Well, some say he's God. Some say he's man, some say he's a great teacher, a rabbi, a leader. And so it's understanding who Jesus is that truly is what makes a difference in our lives. And then what makes it a controversy over his identity is the enemy for sure doesn't want us to understand or mankind today to understand that Jesus really is fully 100% God and 100% man. That he wasn't just created like other human beings, that he was there from the beginning of time. And when things were created, Jesus was there. It was not plan B to send Jesus into the world because mankind would sin. God already knew that that would happen, and Jesus was plan A all along. And so those things are what comes into play is a very important aspect then in our lives. Now, of course, everyone seems to have an opinion of who Jesus is, what he came to really accomplish. And the best thing about it for us this evening is that we don't have to rely on what other people say. Jesus himself revealed the truth about the Bible, including the declaration he gave at the beginning of his ministry. And so one of the best places to start discussing the identity of Jesus is not what others have said about him, but what Jesus says about himself. And so if you have your Bibles this evening, I encourage you to turn to Luke chapter 4. That's where we're going to be, Luke 4. And it records the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness. After Jesus withstood the temptations of the devil, he began his public ministry and really grew in popularity among the people. He then went to his hometown of Nazareth, and there were rumors about his identity circulating throughout the, the community. And no doubt his friends and neighbors were excited to see Jesus return home, but yet some of them were confused about his real identity. Isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this the son of Mary? Isn't his brother James? And so as we go to the scripture this evening, Luke chapter 4, 16 to 21, and then 28 to 30. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and in rolling the scroll, he found a place where it was written. 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recover the sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. We move on down to verse 28. It says, When they had heard this, everyone in the synagogue was enraged. They got up and drove him out of town and brought him to the edge of the hill that their town was built on, intending to hurl him over the cliff. But he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. Now it's important for us this evening to really, why did he choose that passage? What was important about that? Well, that passage is important because it shows Jesus' vision for himself. Jesus saw himself in the fulfillment of the Messianic prophecies, all those of the Old Testament. The crowd was initially very excited to hear that the Messiah was born and that he was one of their own. But as we see, the scripture continues. It shows us that even then, people weren't ready to accept Jesus and his message. And of course, we see that that really hasn't changed today. So why do you think the attitude of the crowd changed so quickly from excitement to violence? One of the things is, I think they thought they, they knew. And then when Jesus was telling them some things that they didn't really understand, it caused conflict within them. What does it reveal about their response to Jesus' identity? They didn't really accept it. And so for us today, it's important to not only understand who Jesus is, but understand why he came, what his purpose is, and what that purpose does to each one of our lives, and how it can not only change us, but transform us. And though Jesus' message, it, it enraged them because they were, they centered their expectations on what they had thought the Messiah should be. They had put the Messiah in a box. He was to come, he was to rule, he was to reign, he was to conquer, he was to free the oppressed. And as Jesus read that, he came to preach the good news to the poor, proclaim the release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and set the free oppressed. And at that point, they just didn't see that Jesus could be the one that could do that. And so, so many times, that's the way it is for us today. As we, as we share the good news of the gospel of Jesus and how he works in our lives and how he works in the lives of our family or in our church, so many others just don't believe that that could happen to them or for them or around them. And so that same dynamic exists today as it did when these scriptures were written about Jesus in. If we're to follow Jesus, then we have to come to Jesus on his terms, not on our terms. And that means following Jesus completely, no matter the cost. And a lot of times we would like to follow Jesus as long as he doesn't change anything in our lives, right? As long as it didn't cause us to do anything different than we're already used to kind of just adding a little Jesus to our day and going on instead of being fully obedient to Christ and what he wants for our lives. And so we need to see that, that Jesus is fully God and he's fully human. 
And so as we explore the person of Jesus and attempt to identify who he is, one of the first truths we need to understand is Jesus is fully God and fully human. We've went over and over and over this, but it has to come to a point in, in our own lives, whether it's mine or yours, that we, that we fully grasp that concept and will accept it 100%. Because that can be a difficult process for some to really comprehend. But the scriptures provide some, some great examples of the highlight of both the elements of Jesus' nature. In Luke 4, we see the example of uh, the evidence of Jesus' humanity. In verse 16, it says, Jesus came to the village of Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And so Jesus himself had a hometown. Did you give a hometown? You know, I grew up in Augusta, Kansas. Haven't lived there for years. Most of my life, I've been, I've been gone from there. But that was my hometown. And I've often thought if I went back, would people see me the way I am today or would they see me the way I was then? And unfortunately, I believe they would see me the way I was then because that's how they knew me. And so that's what happened to Jesus. He had a hometown. He had neighbors. He was part of a community. They knew him. Jesus had regular patterns. He had predictable routines. In verse 16 in Luke chapter 4, it says, As usual, right? You might circle that in your Bible. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. This was something of who Jesus is. That's what he did. That was what he was about. And so it's important for us to understand that he was fully human have made the difference for us, for humanity, as he did. And Luke 4 also provides two interesting pictures of Jesus' divinity. The first one of which was initiated by Jesus himself. He said, after, after being handed the scroll containing the book of Isaiah, Jesus chose to read the prophecy about the Messiah. Each of his hearers would have been familiar with that passage, and each one would have longed for the prophecy to be fulfilled. That's what they were waiting to happen. They were waiting for it. They were longing for it. And so even reading that passage was suggesting that Jesus himself was the one. And Jesus left no doubt. He said, today as you listen, in verse 21, this scripture has been fulfilled. And then the second illustration of Jesus' divinity came when he miraculously passed through an angry mob. And so many times as we read this, we, we read through it fast and we kind of miss what really has taken place here. Our scripture text this evening really makes it clear that the people of Jesus' hometown were so angry they were at the point of being willing to murder Jesus. They were going to take him to the edge of town, to the cliff, and push him out. Yet, Scripture says that Jesus passed through them as if they weren't even there. Now, it's interesting that the people were so angry that Jesus declared himself to be the Messiah... They were, they were angry because God was accepting the Gentiles and rejecting his own people. And yet right as angry as they were, as close as they were to it, Jesus slipped right through their midst. So not only does this passage reveal who Jesus himself knew he was, but it also shows us both the humanity and the divinity of Jesus. He's God and man fully at the same time. Now, Nazareth was where he was brought up. Again, that was his hometown. 
Those regular patterns would have been what people would have saw. And it wasn't until he read that scripture from Isaiah that it angered them. This is just Jesus. He can't make a difference. And so they had missed the point of who Jesus really was. But because Jesus is fully human, he can serve as humanity's representative. Because of his humanity, he can serve as the one who provides salvation for mankind. And then another aspect of that, because he is fully human, he understands the pain that humans experience, whether it's physical pain or emotional pain. He understands the things that we go through. And it was so easy to say, oh, nobody understands what I'm going through. But yet people do. A lot of times we don't have an answer. But Jesus also understands. And that passage that he picked, he could have picked anything to read, but he picked that specific passage out of Isaiah. He was telling them who he was and what he could accomplish. And so this evening, that's what he's telling us. And, and no matter who you are or where you're listening from this evening, that's what Jesus is saying. I am the one that can make a difference in your life. But you personally have to accept that and trust that and invite him into our life. Today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled, Jesus said. But he was surrounded by an angry mob. And so, really, imagine for yourself this evening, just for a moment, what that crowd looked like that Jesus could just pass through it. You know, we saw for months on TV all these riots that take place and, and all the things that were happening. And that's kind of what would have happened. And, and they would have been centered on Jesus, the, the one figure, as they edged him towards the edge of town. And everybody's focus would have been on him. But yet in the midst of that, he slipped right through their midst. They missed him. And unfortunately, that's what happens so much in our lives today is that Jesus is right there. Maybe not physically the way they saw him then, but he is there and moving, and we miss it because we're angered about something else. Something else takes our focus off of Jesus, and in the midst of that, Jesus slips right past us. See, his mission continues on, and it continues to move. And so no matter who we are, we don't stop his mission. We know from uh, past experiences here that uh, the next prophetic thing on the calendar is the rapture of the church, when Jesus comes to take all those believers away. But many will miss it because that's not what they're looking for. That's not what's going to take place for them. And though Jesus accomplished our salvation, and so that's a greater sense of understanding his identity, of who he is. And once again, we have the benefit of scriptures to see this, uh, not just my word. Uh, you know, I said a couple of weeks ago on Sunday morning, uh, you know, don't get mad at me for what I preach on Sunday morning because it's God's word, not mine. Uh, if, if you're angry with him, then that's where you might want to take it up, right? Uh, I don't make the rules. I just unfold them, right? And so in Luke chapter 4, 18 and 19, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim the release to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set, the free, or set free the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
Now, do you see that verse fulfilled in Jesus' life and ministry? Well, if you've read through the Gospels, you, you have. That was his mission. That's who Jesus is. And so on the surface there, you can see, uh, if we just gloss over it, we see that it looks like a lot of social issues. There's good news for the poor, there's freedom for the captives, there's sight for the blind, and there's relief for the oppressed. And it's true because Jesus' ministry did that, and we, we see that multiple times through the gospel where he actually gave sight to the blind, where he fed the multitudes where he accomplished those goals that were set forth. But it's vital to understand that this scripture has a much deeper meaning in mind. The people of Jesus' day believed the Messiah would restore the glory of Israel into a blaze in ministry, a military power, a political power. And yet Jesus knew his mission was primary spiritual. He claimed to come to proclaim the good news of salvation, redemption, to free all people from their captivity to sin, to heal our spiritual blindness. And so many times we think we see but we don't because we're seeing with our own eyes and not looking through the lens that God would have us to look through. And he would set us free from the oppression of our own flesh. So Jesus came to accomplish salvation. So Jesus had this meaning in mind when he read that scripture from Isaiah. The people in Jesus' day believed in a Messiah. They believed the Messiah would restore the glory of Israel. Yet Jesus knew that his mission was a spiritual one. And the people came, they realized and saw this, that what Jesus was saying, they did not think he could accomplish. And so we've got to get past that point in our own lives to thinking that Jesus can't do that. You know, I don't know how many times I've heard that through ministry. Yeah, I know Jesus can do a lot of things, but he, but he can't do this. Oh, really? Jesus who created the world, who healed the, the blind, who raised the dead, who healed the lame, who fed the hungry, can't do whatever you need in your life? They might not do it because that's not his mission and goal for that purpose, but he's fully capable. But remember, Jesus' ministry is spiritual. He came to accomplish our salvation, to set us free and for us to understand that. And again, it's not automatic just because Jesus did what he did. It doesn't mean that we automatically have that. It means that it opens up a door for us. And so one of the important things that it uh, that this Bible study involves is, is studying these Christian doctrines and learning those teachings and to come to bring that into our own lives. The connection here with the identity and the person of Jesus Christ. Throughout history, we've, we've heard and saw, and you can go back and read of, which I wouldn't waste my time, but many false teachers who have spread heresy about the work of the person of Jesus and who he is. And a lot of those false doctrines exist today, and we're facing a lot of that things right in our own country today. And so what steps do we take to properly evaluate those different teachings? Well, they're true or false. And, and, and I continue to tell you, you know, don't study them, study the Bible. 
study God's word to see whether it's true or false. And, and Jesus will tell you. And so we'll know whether it's true or false by what Jesus proclaims and the way he brings that to us. The truth about Jesus helps us to, to guard our hearts, especially in this time that we live today. Especially with the errors, all the false teaching that's around. But it is true, some of the most difficult people to address a lot of times are the people, not just that you know, but the people that know you. And Jesus found that to be true, right in his own hometown. And so you wonder, why would Jesus even go there first? Why would he, why would he begin his ministry in his own hometown? And so it shows us, though, that not even those who were close to Jesus received anything by exemption or by proxy just because they knew Jesus. Just because they grew up with him. They still had to make a decision on their own about who Jesus is. And Jesus said, I am the promised Messiah. There's no need to wait any longer. And as he said before them, he said, the scripture is fulfilled right here. And so right there was where it was at. And so as you study God's word, it's important to study God's word on a daily basis, to be intentional about that. Reading your Bible, spending time with God, uh, connecting to God in prayer. Praying at the beginning of each time before you read, even that that God would open up the window in heaven and, and reveal to you what He wants you to see. To share truths with you about what you need to hear. And then keep our eyes open throughout the day for answered prayer. You know, so many times we we pray and then we just go on and we never wait and look back to see, hey, is God really going to answer that? Or did he answer that? And so what I want you to do this week is really to participate in Jesus' mission. Somehow, some way, I want you to look through here, and you can even see through the Gospels in Luke chapter 4 what, what Jesus was about, and I want you to participate in that some way. And I don't want you to just do it by yourself. I want you to invite somebody else to join in with you as you share in this ministry. And then really deepen your relationship by, by studying who Jesus is and not looking at all the other culture, all the other society, all the other things that are available, but really stopping to see who Jesus is and what he's doing and <clears throat> what a difference that can make today. You know, we live in a, a culture that's really changing now rapidly on a daily basis. And in the midst of those daily changes, uh, we get so focused on the changes and we get focused on the issues of the changes instead of focusing on what Jesus is trying to do in the changes. We often think of Christian doctrine as, as some concept that we can't understand. It's something that's far out there. It's complicated to understand. And, you know, only, only pastors or only, you know, theologians, uh, they're the only ones that really understand it and apply it to their lives. And that was not at all what, what Jesus had hoped for. The, the doctrines of Christian faith are to be developed and used in everyday life in every one of us. And it helps us to understand who we are, what we were meant to be, how we were called to serve God in the process. And in the midst of that, the foundation of everyday life of a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so the good news is that it doesn't have to be complicated. 
The doctrines have practical application in our lives. Our position in life and what God sees is sinful. And when we accept Jesus, then, we're covered by his righteousness. And it's not until we, we leave this world and are glorified that we really see the fullness of that. But as we live our lives today, we're not supposed to continue to live in that sinful life that we once were a part of. As we accept Jesus and his righteousness, it should help us to change and to transform us, to help us to not be caught up in all of those things that we're caught up in. And we can see what he's trying to do in the midst of who we are. Now we use a number of different titles in today's culture for different things. Most of those titles are connected to our jobs, the things we do. A lot of times we can think of a doctor, you can think of a professor, you can think of a judge. Each one of us has multiple hats, if you will, that we wear. You know, I'm a, I'm a son. I was the son of my parents. I'm a husband. I'm a father and a grandfather. But I'm also a pastor. I'm also a neighbor. And then a friend. To a lot of them at the food vendor, a co-worker. And so we all carry multiple hats, if you will, a title about who we are. And unfortunately, a lot of times those titles are connected to who a person was or what a person did. A person's title is a key element of their identity, like I would be a pastor. But we also find that as we explore Jesus' character, in the identity, you know, he was the son of man. He was the son of God. And so first we look at that son of God. Jesus rarely used that title when talking about himself. Most often others use that title of, about him. In Luke chapter 1, verse 35, an angel declared him to be the Son of God. In Luke 4, 40, 41, the demons declared him to be the Son of God. In Luke 22, the chief priests and elders described him as the Son of God. And in John 1, Nathaniel described him as the Son of God. And so in the culture of Jesus today, society was influenced on the concept of, of sonship and inheritance, that you could inherit what your parents had. The eldest son of the family was primarily the heir to the father's whatever he had, which meant he carried his father's status, he carried his father's authority around everywhere that he went. And so to call Jesus then the Son of God was to give Jesus the same level and honor as God. And so that title, Son of God, was a declaration that Jesus was equal with God. And we find that throughout the context of the Bible. And we can say with certainty that Jesus is God. And then we look deeper into that, the Son of Man, in Matthew chapter 20, 26 and 28. This was actually the title that Jesus used most often when referring uh, to himself. Scripture says, it must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. So just as the Son of Man did not come 
to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So that title, the Son of Man, emphasizes Jesus' humanity. It reminds us that Jesus had a physical body, just like yours and just like mine. He shared in weakness, he shared in frailty, he shared in suffering and pain. And so no pain, like I said earlier, is different from what the Lord experienced. No problem is too big for his power. In Hebrews chapter 4, 14 and 15, it says, Therefore, since we have a high priest, a great high priest, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. So how does Jesus' identity impact your life today? Imagine someone who has just lost a loved one to death or just found out that they had, had cancer facing the possibility of death. So many times we find great despair. We find this great sorrow that we don't understand who we are and what's going on and how could, how could God let this be? How could it take this happen? But how can we comfort our friend instead? With the truth that, that Jesus is fully human. He completely understands everything that is going on and has a purpose and a plan even in it. And because he's fully God, he knows and understands what will and can take place. And so then we've seen that, our, that Jesus is both fully human and fully God. He's the Son of God. He's the Son of Man. Even though it's a difficult concept to understand in full, it has a concept that really needs to be understood by us to have a spiritual impact in our lives. And so in John chapter 12, 32 to 36, it says, As for me, I am lifted up from the earth. I will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate what kind of death he was about to die. Then the crowd replied to him, We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus answered, the light will be with you only a little longer. Walk while you have the light so that the darkness does not overtake you. The one who works in darkness doesn't know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become children of light. And then in John 3, 16 through 18, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. And God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned. Because he's not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. And so Jesus' identity, his, his dual nature, Son of God and Son of Man, is a necessary foundation for our salvation. Without his full humanity, without his full divinity, we would be lost. If he was not fully God, he could have not offered salvation to us. If he was not fully man, he could not have done what needed to be done for us to have salvation. Jesus is a necessary element to our salvation. And so these all point back to the Old Testament's Day of Atonement. 
On this day each year, the high priest chose a lamb unto which to place all the sins of the people of Israel. The lamb was then sent out to die in the wilderness, bearing away the sins of the people and leaving them clean before God. Of course, that was a ritual. There wasn't anything special about the lamb chosen each year, nor did the priest really have any kind of power to offer forgiveness. But it was a ritual that was that was pointed forward, prophetic, into the coming of someone who was special enough and who had the power to do just that. And that was Jesus. And that's why in John chapter 1, verse 29 and 30, John the Baptist said, the next day when... John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I told you about. After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. So the doctrine of atonement is easy to remember when you break it into parts. Uh, at one meant atonement. In that single moment, that single moment of time, when Jesus died on the cross, he made us one with God by bearing the punishment for our sins. And it's important to see that Jesus is the only one that could accomplish that. He was fully human and fully God. He was able to take our sins upon himself and to die because of it. Yet since Jesus is fully God, he's larger than even our sins. And I've heard people say that as well. Pastor, you just don't know what I've done. And I don't have to know what you've done. I know what Jesus did. And he's the one that makes the difference. And it's in his power, as God has allowed him to absorb our, our punishment for our sin and yet still rise victorious from the grave. And so this week, I really want to encourage you as you go to church Sunday morning, whether it's on Facebook Live or whether it's being physically there, I want you to take time in that worship service to thank Jesus for his accomplishment for your salvation. Now, I don't know what that looks like for you or how you can do that or whether you uh, can say something or whether you just express it through the song or whether you look intently into the face of God to allow him to speak to you. But I want to encourage you to do that. Again, this evening as we close, I encourage you to Again, share this on your page so others can see the importance of the, the doctrine of uh, identity and the work of Christ. Next week we're in session 10. It's the kingdom of God. Again, this week, uh, uh, worship service will be 10.30 a.m. Facebook Live or live as well. So we invite you to not only join, but invite others to join with you. Take this time the rest of the week to invite some of your friends or your family to join you at worship service Sunday morning at 1030. Right here at Northern Baptist on Facebook Live. And you can do that even by, like I said earlier, sharing this message this evening. Allow that to get out. And all the things about the identity and the work of Christ is this. Just because Jesus did what he did doesn't automatically put you in a place to have salvation. It opens up a door for you to accept what Jesus has done in your life. And so maybe that's what you need to do this evening first. Just say, Lord, I need to accept what Jesus has done for me. I want to accept his salvation that he provides for me into my life. And, and maybe you need to uh, come forward and, and just uh, be baptized in the church somewhere. It's a step. It's a step of obedience in the direction that Jesus wants to follow.
Bible again this evening. We're going to close out in prayer in just a moment. Uh, if you're encouraged by this message and you would like to, to help through the ministries at North Baptist Church, whether it be through the Lighthouse or some of the other several ministries that we're a part of, we encourage you to, to give. Uh, you can give online through the Generosity by Lifeway app that's right on the Facebook page or on our webpage. Uh, you can download that onto your own phone, your uh, your tablet, your personal computer. You can give uh, privately from your own home. You can understand uh, what you've given, how you've given it. Uh, you can track it. It's secure. It's, it, it's private. Uh, you can mail a, a check to North Baptist Church, Post Office Box 117, Ottawa, Kansas. 66067. Put attention to Linda on there and it'll get right to the place it needs to be. Or like I always say, you can join 1030 AM live at North Baptist and drop whatever offering you have right in the offering plate. Uh, allow that to be a part of what continues the ministries at North Baptist Church and things just like we're doing this evening. Uh, Facebook Live. So with that this evening, if you join me in prayer. Lord, we thank you again this evening for your presence with us and Lord, I pray that somewhere through this message this evening that even if my words were jumbled up and, and mumbled and, and confused, that you would take them and utilize them and, and use them in the lives of your people. Lord, you know what each one needs. You know what specific concerns are going on. You know what they need to come to the point of uh, being obedient to you. And so, Lord, I ask that you would utilize that. And, and this evening, as we looked at the identity, uh, the work of the the person of Jesus Christ, Lord, that you would just uh, reveal that to each one that hears this message, whether it's this evening or in the days to come. And so, Lord, we are so thankful. We're so blessed for your love for us. We're thankful that even though we're yet sinners, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us, to provide a way of salvation that we would not be separated from you forever. Lord, help us not only to accept that gift, but to embrace it and to share that with others. And so we give you praise, we thank you, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, it was super great to be with you this evening. Uh, we still got a couple days out and about before we head home. I'd ask for you to pray for safe travels for us. Uh, I encourage you to uh, really uh, share this again on your page, share this with others. Uh, invite somebody to church with you Sunday. Uh, we are coming, you know, we're within just weeks of celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're within weeks of celebrating the, the Palm Sunday, the event where he rode into Jerusalem that really uh, escalated all the events that would take place. And what greater way now to uh, start to invite others to join you in, in just what God's doing in your life, like this Bible study or like worship service. So whatever it is, I encourage you to do that. And remember, this week, Sunday morning, thankful, be thankful for what Jesus has done for you. And whether you do that through song, through word, through expression, uh, just through sincere prayer, I really ask that you would take that to heart. And then we will see you. Hey, we'll be back here next Wednesday night at 7. Uh, we'll be back to Ottawa, Kansas, uh, live. Have a great week. We love you guys. Thanks for joining with us. We'll see you later.